for enzyme purposes. But minerals are raw materials for plants making many things. Now, with this herd, they broke records. So it wasn't sort of some sort of like, you know, herd that said, ah, you know, we're just natural. Or we're just, you know, they used the word organic back in the 40s, 30s. This was based on, they wanted high quality herd. They wanted to be able to show it off. This guy back in 1922 was spending as much as $6,000 for a Jersey cow for breeding purposes. 1922, that's a lot of money. The Devon sale just averaged $6,000 in Texas last week. But today's 2009. 1922, $6,000 for a Jersey cow. I don't know what the inflation rate would be, but is it tenfold? Probably. It's a lot of money. No corn, mangle beets, fodder beets for energy. No lactic acid production from pectins. These are pectins, not starch. Starch in a rumen produces acidosis. Pectins don't. Same high octane energy. Where else do you also find pectins? Forages. See? The architecture. The architecture is intact. You got to look at the blueprint of the original designer and say, what's the architecture of this animal, this thing called a ruminant? Not starch, very little. Sugars, long chain sugars, short chain sugars, pectins, soluble fibers. Cellulose, hemicellulose, beta-glucans, these are all plant fibers and sugar materials, not starch that you find in grain. Doug Gunnick's brother, who's a dairy farmer in Minnesota, conventional guy, did this there just to show you. He was getting 150 pounds of milk off of that ration, which only had eight pounds of corn, three pounds of cotton seed, and a pound of beet pulp. The rest of it was haylage, brown midrib, sorghum, sedan. It's being done. So it's these compounds. So this is one of the things we find out with the refractometer, University of Idaho. Refractometers are used in the wine grape industry. They're used in the maple syrup industry to measure sugar. What did they find out? If you cut the hay late in the day, you're looking around 5, 6 o'clock in the evening, the sugar levels go way up. And those cows that ate that late cut hay, that's all they did, got 7 1⁄2 pounds more milk. Just on cutting late in the day. It's the sugar, it's not the starch. So when we deal with pH at the cellular level, this is what we're looking for. This is what, now, think of yourself, think of your cow, whatever. The inside of the cell is slightly acidic, the outside of the cell is slightly alkaline, 7.4, which by the way is about the pH of the blood, the blood stays at that pH. The outside of the cell, could also be your lymphatic fluid. So how many people test their pH? Anybody ever test their pH with saliva paper? You test the pH of the saliva and the urine, right? What's the pH of the, of the saliva? What should it be first thing in the morning? About 6, 4. All right, and it should rise during the day. The pH of the urine should be under 7. You don't want your pH of the urine above it because your waste products are acidic and you're eliminating metabolic waste products through the urine. If you see a real high pH in your urine, that means you're probably producing ammonia. Ammonia will drive up the pH. So that being said, when you look at pH, pH is a function of energy efficiency, if you want to think about it. Now that's the cell, and that black line that makes up that ellipse, that circle, is the cell membrane. And that's a fatty sandwich membrane. Now we're going to go right in the next slide to show you a little bit about this. That fatty, that, 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 now what we see here is that when the inside of the cell is slightly acid and the outside of the cell is slightly alkaline, across the fatty membrane we create 70 millivolts of electricity. So I even tell the Amish you don't use electricity. Even Amish are electric, you know? Even you're electric. We're all electric. And so that's important because if you don't deal with that issue that way, you end up with livers that look like what? The one on the left or the one on the right? right. That's acidosis on the right, or it could be mold poison, or it could be a lot of rumen ammonia. If you're producing a lot of funny protein, I call it funny protein, when it's really high in protein but not really high in quality amino acids, not high in energy, we call it funny protein. The body has to get rid of that crap. 
It's a waste product. It's toxic to the bloodstream. And so the liver gets overworked. So let's go into the mineral realm. What do these minerals do? Well, they do a lot of things. I'm going to talk about what they do with humans and animals. Electrical impulses is one big thing. They actually make the structure of the, of the framework of the body, the bones, the teeth, um, the connective tissue, all depend on minerals. But the, but the trace elements especially are notoriously responsible for making sure enzyme systems are intact. And remember, you can't do anything without enzymes. You can't think, you can't see, you can't hear, you can't digest, you can't talk, you can't walk, you can't heartbeat. It's all enzyme driven. Now, interestingly enough, 95% of what consists of a plant comes free. It's four elements, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. The air that I'm breathing here is 78 to 80% nitrogen. Isn't that interesting? Another elephant standing in the room. And you think, when you look at the big things, that's the elephant standing in the room. So why are we converting natural gas into nitrate fertilizer when we are sitting on top of 30,000 tons per acre of nitrogen hovering over us? Why are we taking natural gas and making nitrate fertilizer? Because we lost that whole system, that biological system that's taking this nitrogen gas and making protein out of it. We are living in a sea of protein. This nitrogen gas is in our atmosphere because it is the raw material for building all the protein on Earth. That's where our protein comes from, nitrogen, amongst other things. But that's the starting point. Then there's hydrogen and oxygen. That's what? Water. So what's left? Carbon. Everything else comes from the soil, 5%. If you, if you took that leaf of corn, I don't care what it is, ashed it, 5% of that is going to be the rest of the elements. And that's assuming you don't have to apply anything. And your soils have got most of that 5%. So all you're really asked to require is to put a fraction of 5% in the soil to drive 100% of that system. So calcium is the king because we use more in quantity. It's not more important than zinc. We just use more of it. Plants do, animals and people do, so you need to make sure the calcium gets to the cell, starting in the soil. If you have calcium deficient soils, you've got to remineralize the calcium in the soil. If you have biologically compromised soils, and the calcium's there, it's not going to get up into the plant. That's why I do forage tests. It's okay to do a soil test, but the forage test is the report card for the soil. If it's not in the plant and it's in the soil, there's a, there's, there's a disconnect. What's going on? Probably biology, because the biology moves it upstairs. So it's very, very important to get the calcium to come up into the plants, to build quality protein, to build adequate energy. It's the key component of proteins in the, in the uh, cell nucleus. And if you don't have the calcium, the protein uh, compounds are then replaced with magnesium, which are inferior. This is Albrecht's work. Calcium pectate, if a cell wall, if, if this room was a cell, we're inside the cell, the cytoplasm, the ceiling and the floor and the walls consist of this box of the cell wall. Good, healthy cells in plants are, con are comprised of calcium pectate. It gives them rigidity, protection against fungal attack, and in animals that eat foods that depend on grasses for energy, that's called pectin, and pectin is that energy that's not starch. That's where you get it from. That's how you get energy out of grass. The conventional wisdom says, oh, you can't feed just grass, you can't feed just legumes and grass because there's no energy in it. Well, it's only a half truth. There's no energy in it if you don't want there to be any energy. And I talked about ATP and phosphorus. It's the energy molecule. It's synergistic with calcium. So when you look at the ratios, that's why we call the calcium phosphate soils the appetite soils. These are the rich soils. You have a lot of calcium and phosphorus in a lot of your Florida soils. I think your limiting factor down here in Florida is a lot of your biology. And you've got this invasive species on the sandy soil, so you've got to build humus here. And you have high oxidation rates because you're semi-tropical. You're subtropical. So you burn up carbon here. 